let's bring it all the way back to square one. Uh, everything that's going on in the body is controlled by the brain. It's my belief that the, when the brain perceives danger, symptoms are the result. I'm telling you that your brain and your nervous system is working perfectly. And anytime you have an illness that not only has three initials, but a slash and two more, CFS slash ME, as the brain perceives more and more danger, symptoms can absolutely intensify. Scrap the labels. Because all that does is stamp a thing on your head that says, I'm broken. That was the moment where I realized that I was never sick. That was just some idea that I had about myself. Well, what you're doing is showing the brain, I'm perfectly fine. I'm not afraid. I'm okay. Consistent messages of safety are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast, Healing Differently, and the YouTube channel. I'm here today together with Dan Buglio, and he was a huge inspiration for me in my own healing journey. And here he is. So thank you very much for wanting to talk with me, Dan. All right. Sounds great. And do you prefer Daniel or Dan? It's both okay. But since you are Dan, I can be Dan Daniel. <laughs> All right. My mom still calls me Danny. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, appreciate it. Great. So yeah, we've already talked a little bit before the, uh, the, the talk. I've had chronic fatigue syndrome myself. Uh, eight years ago, I had a viral infection with a fever and, and the flu, and that flu-like symptoms never really went away. Plus, I got horrible crashes whenever I did something, it's like sort of post-exertional malaise. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the same thing that marathon runners have when they, um, when they are almost finished, they hit the wall. So it, it feels like I ran a marathon, but I didn't do anything. Right. And I was, I was like, what is wrong with me? What is this? And I searched the internet full of things. And there were so many things, you know, that cerv cervical spine stenosis, uh, the mitochondria being damaged, um, tooth problems. Someone told me I had to remove all my dental, all my, all my teeth. And, uh, the immune system was weak, uh, whatever, um, just a lot of stuff that we had to do in protocols. And I, I did all of them, but I, did, I didn't remove my teeth. And I was like, what is this? It's sort of, sort of a burnout and I stopped working and I didn't really have a clue what was going on with me. Stop work When I stopped working, and this is almost for everyone that I speak the case, then things really hit rock bottom because then you've got like 100% of your time to focus on your problems. Sure. I agree. So if someone is listening and is exactly in that spot where I used to be like seven years ago, what would you say with your knowledge about TMS and pain and these kind of symptoms? Yeah. So let's bring it all the way back to square one. Uh, everything that's going on in the body is controlled by the brain. And so it is my belief, and I've seen uh, lots of examples of people getting better by implementing a process I, I teach and share. It's my belief that the, when the brain perceives danger, symptoms are the result. Now, in my world, my symptoms were back pain, sciatica. And I had 13 years of that. Um, I was not a chronic fatigue sufferer. So that was not something that was very heavy for me. Um, but I will say I recently had some kind of viral infection. It was not COVID, but I was out for about a week. And the fatigue was very strong. Um, was that viral? Was that my brain perceiving danger? I don't know. I'm not really sure. But what I can tell you is this. I feel perfectly fine now. I had a little bit of um, lightheadedness, kind of a feeling like a little bit of a faster heart rate, and uh, particularly on moving, a little bit of dizziness uh, as a result of being sick. So was that truly a viral thing or illness, or was it the brain perceiving danger? What I can tell you is none of it became persistent or chronic because I gave it zero fear, 
zero attention, and I trusted my body to recover from whatever was going on, whether it was physical, structural illness, or the brain creating symptoms. So I do believe that perceived danger creates virtually any symptom in the body, all right? If the brain perceives that life is too intense, this is not scientific, this is kind of me joking a little bit, but uh, if the brain perceives that life is too intense, too overwhelming, too scary, too dangerous, it essentially says, take a nap, go to sleep. Now, are there a lot of things that are happening through the mitochondria, the adrenal system, the you know, the blood work, the oxygenation. Yes, there's all sorts of stuff going on. But trying to become a microbiologist to solve the problem of fatigue, as you may well know, uh, leads you down many dark paths of processes, treatments, worries, fears, more fears. This treatment didn't work. Oh, no, now I have to do this, right? And we can get very lost in the medical world I call it getting traumatized by the medical system. We become medicalized, right? Because we go to doctor, doctor, doctor. Nobody's got an answer. Everybody looks at you and goes, Daniel, you're young, you're healthy, you're fit. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. It looks like you eat a reasonably healthy diet. It doesn't make sense. So is it possible? And I'm not coming up with a diagnosis. These are just theories that may fit for you, may fit for others, but is it possible that as a result of your true viral illness, your brain got into a place where it says, oh no, we've got a problem. And the brain's job is safety and survival at all costs. And so maybe it said, we've got to allocate resources. Daniel needs to rest. We need to recover. We need to heal from this illness. And so we start to rest. And with enough fear and attention, on the fatigue symptoms, they can grow and magnify and become learned. And the more fear you've got surrounding this fatigue, like you said, the more you sit around at home on bed rest going, I can't even get up and go to the bathroom without being absolutely exhausted. I feel like I just ran a marathon, but I didn't. And all the while, the brain is just trying to keep you safe because the safest place for you is in bed or on the couch and resting because everything yeah. else is too dangerous. Now, this stuff, in my opinion, Daniel, is not all based on conscious thought. I'm not saying any of this was your fault or something you did to yourself. I think the brain, subconscious brain, manages everything. The autonomic nervous system, the, the heart rate, the breath, the you name it. Even fearful thoughts are coming from a scared brain that's going, oh, no, what if we never get out of this fatigue? Right? As the brain perceives more and more danger, symptoms can absolutely intensify. And what I am seeing more and more, about a year, a little more than a year ago, I went from talking about TMS, right? And I used to joke, too much stress, TMS. But that's Dr. Sarno's theory. And for anybody who doesn't know who Dr. Sarno is, he's been writing about this mind-body reason for symptoms since the 70s, 80s, you know. And um, his theory is that it had everything to do with emotions, right? Repressed negative emotions, primarily rage, were why people would end up with back pain or headaches or any number of things. Um, so if you're not familiar with Dr. Sarno, you can certainly look him up on Amazon, maybe buy a book and uh, start understanding the original theories. Uh, when I talk about perceived danger being the driving force behind the brain creating symptoms, I think the symptoms are the brain's warning signal to say, Daniel, there's something bad going on. And I need to warn you, but I'm the subconscious brain. So I can either give you worrying thoughts, oh no, what if this fatigue never goes away? Or I can give you fatigue, in which case you're gonna pay attention. Sarno thought that the brain perceived these negative emotions as dangerous and thereby created something physical like pain 
to distract us from the emotions or protect us. I like the word protection better. But within Sarno's theory, that still fits under the umbrella of perceived danger. Brain perceived emotions is dangerous. It's distracting us with some pain, right? Mm -hmm. In your case, I don't know if that applies. Maybe the perceived danger was the viral illness that you had. And your brain perhaps may have um, amplified the, the fear and danger from that illness. And once you started tumbling down that, you know, snow covered mountain slope, the snowball got bigger and bigger and bigger and the fear got bigger and the perceived danger and the lack of answers from the doctors and medical authorities and research that you did on the internet and treatments didn't work. And that snowball got bigger and bigger and bigger until the point where you were on bed rest. You couldn't do anything because your brain was terrified. So now yeah. I don't know too much about your story. I spent a couple of minutes on your website. We touched very briefly, but it sounds like you have come mostly through the very extreme um, fatigue symptoms. And I would venture to say that one of the ways you did that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is you dialed down the fear of the fatigue and you taught your brain, we're really not in danger. Hey, look, brain, I'm a young, healthy, fit guy. There's no reason for me to be this fatigued. And as you dialed down your fear and created more safety, your brain started to lift some of these feelings of fatigue. And the fatigue is real. For anybody listening, nobody here is saying that the fatigue is not real. It's very real. It's just, in my opinion, I could be wrong. In my opinion, it's created by a brain that is perceiving a whole bunch of danger about energy usage and metabolism and dietary choices and hydration and supplements and right. And if the brain is always on the lookout for danger, it's probably going to find it. <laughs> so I, I do believe that perceived danger creates symptoms, particularly fatigue. And one of the reasons this comes true is, or believe, one of the reasons I believe it is, I spoke to a lady about five years ago. She was in England. She had to climb to the second floor of her home for us to do a one-on-one -on -one coaching call. And she got on the call and she was like, I'm so exhausted. And she was coming to me because she had some pain, but she was also absolutely floored with exhaustion, fatigue. And what ended up happening was we spoke for about an hour and a half, and I shared a lot of my, my understanding and recommendations for her. She sent me an email the next day. She says, Dan, it was unbelievable. I could barely climb the steps. I was practically crawling up the steps to get up to the computer to have the call with you. After the call, I had so much energy, I actually hoovered, vacuumed the house. Well, how is that possible? Did her mitochondria and energy and adrenals all recover like that? Or did the brain say, wow, we're not in trouble. We're okay. And very quickly, the fatigue lifted. Um, and I, I've spoken to other people with fatigue uh, in my coaching program. Inevitably, the more fear, focus, attention, and micromanaging, how's my fatigue level now? How is it now? Inevitably, the more focus you put on it and the more fear you apply to it, the worse you feel. The more you say to the brain, shh, I've got something to do. I'm going to jump in the car. I got to drive eight hours and I'm going to go on vacation. And I can do this. Well, what you're doing is showing the brain, I'm perfectly fine. I'm not afraid. I'm okay. Consistent messages of safety are things I talk about in my videos a lot. And this one lady in my group program has been able to go to Puerto Rico. She went for a month. She went up to Maine for several weeks, hanging out with friends and doing more. Does she still have some fatigue? Yes. When does it normally hit? When she's thinking about her fatigue more often, thinking about it and fearing it. So fear and attention, in my opinion, keeps symptoms going. So I've been rambling a little bit here, Daniel, and... Uh, <laughs> I'm just kind of, I know you came at me and were like, oh, can you talk about fatigue? And, you know, 
my group coaching program is not for one specific symptom. It's called Pain Free You, primarily because when I was coming up with the name, I was a pain guy. I had pain myself and, you know, Sarno wrote about healing back pain. And so pain is a huge component of this mind-body space and perceived danger absolutely creates pain, but it can create things like fatigue, digestive stress, headaches. Just did a success story a couple hours ago with a gentleman with uh, headaches and migraines. And he, through this process of teaching his brain that he's not in danger, he's eliminated daily persistent headaches and migraines. And now he just recorded a success story for me. So virtually any symptom can be created by the brain perceiving danger. Sometimes that danger is actual, like a real true viral illness. Um, and other times it can be perceived. Daniel, you just walked to the bathroom. That was way too much activity. Get back in bed. That's a perceived danger. It's not a true danger. And that's know. exactly what people say in coaching with me. Like, I don't dare to go to the toilet. So I have this little thingy next to my bed where I can pee in because I'm so afraid to go to the bathroom. Because they're I, fearful of the what happens afterwards. Yeah. And you, you also said something about, like, people believe that they have limited energy. Mm -hmm. But sometimes something happens and they've got a lot of energy. So sometimes they think they're overdoing it. And other times it's just like, oh, wow, suddenly I have a lot of energy. And then they go ups and downs and ups and downs, and they're afraid then afterwards for the things they did. And that yeah. becomes sort of a mess. Yeah. So one thing I'll, I'll caution anybody listening is stop trying to figure it out, right? Because if you say, oh, I did this, bam, I was floored by fatigue for a week. What are you going to do with that one thing from now on? you're never going to do it again, right? So if you are searching for and identifying and writing down and remembering these 18 things trigger my fatigue, what are you going to do? You're going to shrink your world so you never do any of those 18 things and you'll end up like Daniel in bed because we're so terrified of the you know, flooring fatigue that's consuming us and devastating because we literally... Fortunately, I've never felt dealt with it, but I've talked to a, quite a number of people with it. Uh, you just feel like, well, if I do this, I'm going to end up in bed for a week and I'm going to have to pee in a little, you know, a little bottle uh, because it's too tiring to go to the bathroom. And that belief system perpetuates the brain's perception of danger or fear to say, don't do that. Don't do that. And then we get caught up in our negative thinking or fearful thinking our catastrophic thinking, will this ever end? I've gone to every doctor known to the sun and nobody can figure me out. I'm a young, healthy, fit guy and they the doctors can't figure it out. So I must be some specially kind of broken, some special kind of illness that they haven't found yet. And I'm sure there's many people listening that feel that way. It's very common. And what I will tell you is none of this is your fault. It's where you ended up. Now, the great news, Daniel, by example, and me by my anecdotal stories of people I've worked with, there is a solution, right? And some people will hear like, well, this mind-body thing. Okay, so Dan, you're telling me you're, my body's okay. Are you telling me my brain's messed up? What's wrong with my brain? Why is my brain doing this to me? <laughs> Don't, right? I'm afraid of my brain now. Now I'm afraid of fear because... You're telling me perceived danger is a problem, so I can't be afraid anymore. Oh, no. I'm afraid of fear. I'm afraid of my brain. Am I mental? Am I emotionally disturbed? What are you telling me? I'm telling you that your brain and your nervous system is working perfectly. Perfectly. It's just operating on bad data, meaning misinformation, and fear. What's the misinformation? Well, spend an hour looking up chronic fatigue syndrome and myoencephalitis on the internet. You're going to see a lot of fearful stuff. And I'm not encouraging you to do that because many of your viewers <laughs> have already done that and have been down that path. And there's not much out there other than a whole bunch of fear 
a bunch of theories, a bunch of opinions as to what the cause is. And correct me if I'm wrong, there's not really a blood test to say, yep, you've got chronic fatigue. You know, it's a, a clinical diagnosis based on your symptoms. So, yeah, I think at a certain moment, they will find because, you know, something is happening in the body created by the brain. So at some point they will get a test and say, you've got this, but that would actually, for many people then is a big celebration, but that would actually be the downfall of the possibility to, to heal. Because then they'll say, look, see, I've got a real problem. I haven't been making it up. I'm not just lazy. I have a real problem. Okay. Yeah. What do we do with that? So and I guess the question is, if they can ever come up with that test to find that marker that shows, yep, Daniel has chronic fatigue syndrome. It's right here in the lab test. Now what? What do we do with that? Wait another 15 years for them to figure out the solution to this microbiology problem that they say they found? At the end of the day, Daniel didn't have a solution that came in a bottle of supplements. The solution came from between his ears, you know, from his conscious thinking brain, dialing down the fear, learning more about it, understanding how fatigue works, how the brain works, and how fatigue is, at least in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, maybe you agree, fatigue is the brain's way of protecting you and keeping you safe. Yeah. Where else could you be more safe but at home in your own bed? And I think there is also another type of fatigue. If you're stressed the entire day, then you will become drained. And if you can't sleep because you're stressed, then you'll become exhausted on top of it. So there are a few types of fatigue. Um, well, yeah. And, and I'm not saying that there's no physical component to it. But what's causing the fatigue that you just described? If you're stressed all day, well, what is stress? The perception that, oh, I'm in this place that I don't want to be in. And it's all fear. Yeah. It's all danger. And then so, looking on this. Look. Do the adrenals pump? Yes. Can they get fatigued? I guess. But I think the brain is capable of creating more adrenaline and more adrenaline. And people are in fight or flight response sometimes for years, it seems. So are there chemical biological changes in the body as a result of fatigue or stress? Yes. Yes. How about mental thinking? I didn't say you're mental, but <laughs> you know, are we, are, can our thoughts create the stress response? Absolutely. You know? And so, yes, there are biological changes. In my opinion, those are the result of the brain perceiving danger and not the cause of the fatigue in the first place. Right. Because if you say, look, we got a blood test. Well, they even say with things like depression, it's a brain imbalance, right? A chemical imbalance in the brain. Maybe it is measurable. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I haven't done studies on it, but is a chemical imbalance in the brain the cause of depression? Or did depression cause the chemical imbalance in the brain? Because it is secreting different you know, chemicals and hormones as a result of this low mood of depression. Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? So I, <laughs> that's the chicken the more, and the egg. The more we focus on the body and figuring out the body and trying to treat the body with medications and supplements and dietary changes, the more the brain goes, we got a problem. Right. And the more we think about it, and the more we fear it, and the more you catastrophize it and think, oh my goodness, I'm only the X number of years old. I'm going to be this way for the rest of my life. Because yeah. that's what some of the internet sites will say. This is a lifelong illness. There is no cure. The best we can do is manage it by pacing, yeah. you know, gradual exposure and all this stuff. And, you know, I know there's a lot of well-meaning people out there, but they're creating more fear by saying, you're sick. You've got this illness. And anytime you have an illness that not only has three initials, but a slash and two more, CFS slash ME, <laughs> must be really sick because I've got five initials. Yeah. So there's a lot of credibility to these medical labels. Um, and for anybody watching, I would probably say if this 
stuff that we're talking about makes sense with you. Scrap the labels. Because all that does is stamp a thing on your head that says, I'm broken. And every time you say, I have CFS, ME, your brain goes, huh. I remember all the stuff we read about that. I remember what the doctors told us about that. We got a problem. Yeah. You say, I'm still feeling fatigued. I'm tired. That sounds a little bit less long-term, doesn't it? You know, I'm actually glad that you're saying this. So this way people don't get angry on me. <laughs> oh, they can hate on me? <laughs> Look, no disrespect, folks. I'm not suggesting that what you are going through is imagined, make-believe. I'm not saying you're lazy. I'm not saying any of that stuff. CFS ME is, a, in my opinion, a set of symptoms that are very well categorized around the word fatigue. And they can have very, very dramatic impacts on our lives, on your life. So much to the point that you can barely get out of bed to go to the bathroom, right? So yeah. I, I'm not minimizing that in any way, shape, or form. So if anybody is hearing me talk and going, he doesn't understand, I got a real problem. Well, I do understand. And it is a real problem. Yeah. It may That's just the reason. It may just be caused by something different than the doctors have told you. It yeah. may be caused by the brain perceiving danger. And it's not your fault. You didn't do it to yourself. It's just where you ended up. And the great news is, and the thing that Daniel focuses on the most is helping people to learn about it. And once you understand it, you now have a path forward to say, I get it. I understand how it works. The good news is there's a way out. Daniel proved it for himself. How many years? Nine years, you said? Um, Seven? Um, I, I think I had it like six years in total, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's a long time to be feeling that fatigued. And yeah. you're doing much, much, much better. And so what you've proven is through your own learning, understanding, dialing down the fear, a.k.a. the perceived danger, your brain started to make different decisions about how to operate this machine called the human body. Hey, um, yeah, thanks. I, I'm sorry, I was like already a while back, I wanted to ask you some, some okay. questions with things By that you were means, saying. Please. please. Like, first of all, I always thought that I was sick all, during all those years, but then there was a summer that I was completely relaxed and uh, enjoying my life, uh, going to the lake. Uh, fatigue went away within a few days. And uh, it came back afterwards, but that was the moment where I realized that I was never sick. That was just some idea that I had about myself. And that was also time that I was already involved in, uh, in Dr. Sarno's work in TMS. Nice. But what, then talking about the emotions, we, we talked about it already, like uh, fear a lot. What I've noticed in myself is that um, before my viral infection, mm -hmm. I was in a good phase. That means I was safe. And before I was in an abusive relationship, uh, lots of childhood trauma. And that sort of came up as well at that moment with uh, when the fatigue started. Suddenly my body thought like, let's get these emotions out of the system. My brain was like, oh my God, he's so afraid. He's so angry. Um, let's let's block this. Yeah. So I work a lot with... Um, emotional healing, inner child therapy. And I know you, I think you don't really do that, right? So what's your perception that. of that? Um, I believe there can be value in doing that from a psychological standpoint, from an understanding, you know, how I ended up here um, for my own journey. The emotional work was not the solution. Okay, so Dr. Sarno talks about the brain perceives the repressed negative emotions, primarily anger and rage, as dangerous. And therefore, a whole host of people following Sarno have said, well, if the repressed negative emotions are the problem, I got to go find them. And, you know, that's created, you know, probably millions of people over the past 50 years who are trying to dig up their past childhood traumas and find the repressed emotions. 
and I, you know, I've been coaching probably for a solid six, seven, eight years. I forget exactly when I started, worked with, you know, high hundreds, if not thousands of clients. I interact with tens of thousands of people a year through my Facebook, YouTube, and all the comments that come to me. I don't think I can remember anybody that says, I found it. This happened in third grade. And when I found that and experienced that trauma again, poof, all my symptoms went away. Right. And Dr. Sarno even wrote about a woman, I think her name was Elaine, who had an outburst of rage and her back pain went away. And everybody who reads the book goes, I want that. I want right. that. Where's my outburst of rage? And then we go looking for it and we're looking for the, the repressed emotions. In the meanwhile, the brain's still perceiving danger. Like in my case, I did all the emotional work. I journaled for six months. You know, um, I never went to therapy. I did not go to a trauma-informed counselor. Um, I didn't do all that, but I journaled and I wrote about everything I could remember from my childhood to, you know, my present moment, uh, personality traits. What do I believe about myself? And never got better as a result of doing that. Now, was it useful? I guess to a degree. And if people are saying, I think I need therapy, are you doing it to fix your symptoms or are you doing it because you'd like to get better acquainted with yourself? I think they can be two separate things. I'm not saying trauma work is not beneficial. It most likely is. For somebody who's been severely traumatized and it's still affecting their daily life, by all means, if you can find a good trauma-informed expert to help you, that may allow you to dial down the current day impact of your past traumas. But I don't, within my course, and within my coaching, I don't tell people, spend a bunch of time digging up the past skeletons, the past traumas. Number one, it wasn't part of my solution. I'm not saying it hasn't helped other people, it very well may. Um, but number two, I'm not qualified to tell somebody, I just met on a one-on-one -on -one coaching call, Here's how you go review all your past traumas and do it safely. I mean, I have no idea what some of the folks I am working with have experienced in their lives. I've heard some of the stories. Some of them are pretty horrific. And it would be very, at least in my opinion, irresponsible of me to say, you need to dig up the trauma. And so you were physically, mentally, and sexually abused as a three-year-old girl. Go work on that. See you next week. Are you kidding me? Hmm. That could traumatize them. That could send them into a spiral. Symptoms could get worse. Mentally, they could have a break. Like I, I don't think we get, and, and I'm not telling you that the way you approach things is incorrect, but I don't think we, we overcome trauma by reliving it again and again and again. I think we overcome trauma with one thing, safety. I'm okay now. I'm not getting physically, mentally, or sexually abused. I'm not three years old anymore. I'm a, I'm a grown-up. I'm an adult. Let me look around. I'm in a safe home. Nobody's attacking me. I'm not being abandoned by my parents or grandparents or whatever. I'm okay. In my opinion, that's a much faster path to recovering from trauma and going back and re-experiencing it. And again, That's good. I'm not a trauma-informed specialist. I haven't deeply studied trauma, but I have worked with a bunch of people who have gone through some traumas. And most of them tell me when I focus on the fact that I'm safe now, my past traumas don't, don't bother me as much. And yeah. there are people who carry their traumas around like a badge of honor. In other words, I was working with a lady who's 60 years old and some horrible stuff happened when she was 14. Almost every call we had, and we had a lot of calls she'd be talking about, but my trauma when I was 14, but my trauma when I was 14, she kept revisiting it over and over and over and carrying it around as like, I'm 60 now, but what happened at 14 is why I'm messed up now. It's like, that's why you still are experiencing the results of that trauma because you can't put it down. Yeah. No judgment for anybody who's gone through this. No judgment. Yeah. 
it actually also means that it is not a trauma because if it were to be a trauma, then you wouldn't remember. So people have these- it depends these, on the level of trauma. Yeah. yeah. There, are, there are certain extreme traumas that the subconscious brain is so smart that it literally blanks out the memory and we don't yeah. remember. But yet, but, that person but has, has a perception that something dangerous is going on, even though they can't remember it. So look, I'm not suggesting any of this stuff. It's straightforward, simple. It's a very complex thing. And everybody's life is different. Everybody's childhood is different. Our traumas are different. I've just seen through experience and working with a whole bunch of people that one of the best ways of moving people forward is to say, I'm okay now. And even though I'm feeling this extreme fatigue, or in my case, the back pain, the sciatica, the guy I spoke to this morning, his migraine headaches, when you understand that the body's actually okay, and the brain is creating it to protect us, it's a warning signal. But I'm here to tell you that there's, it's a false alarm. The fire alarms might be ringing, but there's no fire. Right. And what you've learned is, I was never sick. I went on holiday for a summer and you learned a little bit about the mind body and you decided for that summer, I'm going to actually go enjoy this lake and my holiday. And what happened? Your brain was like, oh, Daniel's safe. Look at that. Cool. Yes. And it left you alone. You were not fatigued. Now, maybe when you got back after the holiday, you got back home where you had experienced all your fatigue and the brain went, oh no, we're back in that scary place. And oh, he's got, he's thinking about work again and he's doing it. What changed? Geography, yes, you're in a different location, but what changed? You're back home, the perception of danger went from cool and calm and everything's good at the lake to da-da, we're back in Dangerville. And what happened? Your fatigue boom, came right back. Yes. Exactly. Fascinating, which proves it's not a physical thing. It is a brain perceiving danger thing. Again, folks, not your fault. You're not doing it to yourself. I'm trying to be as gentle as I can because there's no judgment here from me or Daniel. Uh, we're literally here to try to help as many people as we can because I got better from my pains he got better from his fatigue. I've helped countless people around the world with this concept of perceived danger resolve all sorts of symptoms. You name it, migraines, pelvic pain, neuralgias, uh, heart palpitations, POTS, dizziness, vertigo, pains, you name it, everywhere in the body practically. Um, getting better by one thing understanding that per the brain perceiving danger is the cause and safety is the solution. So when you teach your brain that you're really not in danger, it starts operating this human machinery so much more effectively and efficiently because it doesn't have to turn on the siren and warn you all the time. And so this stuff, mm -hmm. very legit, Daniel's proof of it. And he and I never spoke until today. Right now, this is our first conversation. Um, so it's not like we've kind of pre-planned our discussions. <laughs> so, or maybe so, we I did. Mean, oh, no, sorry. We hey, experienced um, similar things in different symptom worlds. I had 13 years of pain. He had six years of uh, fatigue. Yeah. I turned into a coach. He turned into a coach. Wonderful. Yes. Hey, I've got one question because I asked in the Facebook group uh, for people if they wanted to have questions if they have questions and um sure. i think you've answered most of them already oh by all means and uh, one is when to put attention to pain versus listening to what the symptoms are telling us so a lot of people try to figure out what the symptoms are telling us you know does it mean that i need to end my relationship or change my job or move out of this crazy location because I don't like my neighbors. You know, we can always look for a message. What's the symptom telling us? You know, I, I joked that, you know, people with headaches or migraines, you know, you can look for the message. What or who in your life makes your head want to explode, right? 
Problem is, as long as you still have symptoms, you're going to say, I don't know what the message is. Just like if we think the repressed negative emotions or past traumas are the reason for the symptoms, as long as you have symptoms, you're going to say, I got to find the repressed emotion. I must not have found it yet because I still hurt or I still have symptoms. I, I'm still fatigued or I haven't found the message yet. And so, I mean, we can come up with all sorts of messages that seem to make sense. For fatigue, it would be like, slow down. Life is too intense. You got to take a break. You're working too hard. You're too much of a people pleaser, perfectionist, always doing for other people. You're never taking care of yourself. Yeah, that's a message that absolutely makes sense and probably fits for many, not all, but some people in the fatigue world. Okay, but what do we do with that? How does that solve the problem? The brain still believes that if you get up to go to the bathroom, you're going to be floored for a week of fatigue. How does the message and understanding what the symptoms are trying to tell you, how does that solve the problem is my question. And let's say um, there is a social event and people are a bit anxious socially. Um, so they feel like uh, they need to perform or people please or mm -hmm. whatever. And then after that, they develop fatigue. And um, yes, so, so how would you deal with triggers relating to coping mechanisms? Do you have any, th any thoughts on that? So many of these things tend to become less important, the more you have the foundation. Like I talk about the foundational knowledge. Your brain is your best friend. It's not malfunctioning. It's not, you're not, you don't have a mental disorder or an emotional disorder. Certainly don't have a physical disorder. Um, but foundationally, the brain's just doing its, doing its best to keep us safe. It's just operating on misinformation and fear. So when you get the foundation right, which is I understand what's going on, I don't need to necessarily figure out all the perceived dangers, but I do understand what causes this in theory. I believe it applies to me, right? You said you read Sarno's book and you said, yep, this, this makes sense for me. Um, and then the next thing that you got to get through to yourself is, all right, this makes sense. It applies to me and I can do this. I can apply these concepts and do this because there's a lot of people who go, Dan, I understand TMS, perceived danger pain. I even think it, it's what's going on with me, but I'm too anxious. I'm too health conscious. I'm too, I'm too much of a worrier. I can't stop my thinking brain from just thinking catastrophically about being in fatigue for the rest of my life. So I can't, you know, I get it. I understand what's going on, but I don't think I can deal with this. I don't think I can do this. So foundationally, what's going on? Does it apply to you? And yes, you have what it takes. Why? Because you're a human being, just like everybody else who's gotten better from this stuff. We all have the same operating system, the same, you know, the same machinery. And the brain works the way it works. If the brain's perceiving danger, it's going to create some noise to get our attention to protect us. And when the brain feels safe, turns down the sirens. The smoke detector goes off or it gets shut off. Right. And so I think once you have that foundational knowledge, it becomes easier to dial down the fearful thinking and the emotions of fear and worry and all that stuff. The body will take care of itself. I did a video today, this morning, that said uh, symptoms always follow mindset. And mindset is, what do I think is going on and how do I feel about it? Well, if I think I'm massively sick and I'll be sick forever, what do I feel about it? I'm massively depressed and in despair and, and I'm terrified. Guess what? Your symptoms are going to probably reflect that and keep going. But if you can fix the thinking and go, no, I understand that. Remember the foundation we laid earlier? I understand that the brain is creating the fatigue in order to protect me because it thinks life is too overwhelming or whatever perceived danger the brain may have seen. I see that. I know it applies to me and 
I can do this. I can get out of this because other people have, so I can too. Right? We can yes. go there. That's that's the solution is understanding foundationally what's going on. From there, there's things we can do to teach ourselves that we're safe. Instead of laying in bed catastrophically thinking, maybe let's know how some happy music. Dance in bed, even if you can't go anywhere, you know? Watch some funny movies, watch silly cat videos. Call a friend, not, not to talk about your fatigue, but to see how they're doing. What's going on? Tell me a funny story about your grandkids, right? When you start doing those normal things and you get out of your head, which says, I'm in trouble and I got to fix it. When you start to engage in life more, what does your brain perceive? A lot more safety. Hey, look, Daniel's doing normal things. He must be okay. It's exactly what happened on your holiday at the lake. Right. But the more we get consumed by our symptoms and focused on the symptoms and what that means about our future, what does the brain perceive? Trouble. We're in trouble. Ah. So, coping mechanisms, we f all find ways to do coping mechanisms. Uh, can you get a wheelchair with a little motor on it because you don't want to exhaust yourself? Yes, you can. What are you teaching your brain? My body is too weak and frail to even walk. Right? Are you confirming the brain's perception of danger? Yes. Now, am I judging you for doing that? No, not at all. Not at all. My mom was, you know, probably in her 60s or 70 when she went to Disney World with her grandchildren. And she just couldn't walk as far as they needed to walk. She got a little scooter. No judgment. Ended up being kind of fun for her and the grandkids who could sit on the ground. <laughs> go. Right? So yes. coping mechanisms, we all have them. Sometimes it's an afternoon nap. Sometimes it's, who knows, a cup of coffee for the fatigue doesn't matter. We're all just trying to figure out how to get through the day. But if you don't understand what's actually going on and causing it, and you don't understand the path moving forward, which is to teach yourself that you're safe emotionally, physically, and mentally, a big way of doing that is by understanding the what's going on and how to get out of it, and then giving as little fear and attention to the fatigue as possible. And gradually, I'll say that, starting to resume more and more activity, doing so without a lot of fear of, you know, the, the blowback of being laid up in bed forever. That's how you start to regain your life. And, and, you know, Daniel, you tell me when you started to get better, was it boom, I'm done. I'm, I'm perfect. Or was it an up and down journey? Oh, lots started. of ups and downs. Yeah. So flare ups from, engaging in the world more and, you know, better times. And yes. so the good news is the better times show you what's possible. And you Plus, said, you said three days, your fatigue was gone. Yes. Like all of a sudden my fatigue was gone. So the structural thing was not structural anymore. It wasn't biochemical. It wasn't adrenal. It wasn't metabolism because all those things would likely Take yeah. a lot more time to change than three days. But you know what changed? Your brain's perception of danger. Wow. Different it's environment, amazing. not in the suffering place. He's on holiday. There's a beautiful lake. He's surrounded by friends or family, whoever you were with. Cool. We're all right. And all of a sudden, the brain just goes, turns off the switch. And you enjoy, you know, a good time. The key yeah. is to get to that place of safety and knowing deeply that you're okay. and that was the best experience that you could have had because now anytime you're feeling fatigued, you can go, Hey brain, don't you remember this? There's not a darn thing wrong with my body. So brain, shh, turn off the fatigue. We're good. Yeah. I can handle standing at this rock concert for six hours. It's not going to floor me for six weeks. I'll be a little tired standing on my feet and I'll be probably a little bit tired tomorrow. That's normal stuff. You don't have to floor me with this. I don't have to sleep in the back seat on the way home. Right. Yes. Since we can have those rational conversations with our brain, but you got to start with an understanding of what's going on, that it does apply to you and you are capable of getting better. And even fearful thoughts, 
the worrying. Oh no, what if I can't get better? What if what if Dan is full of crap? And what if Daniel got lucky? This won't ever work for me. You think you're going to get better with that type of mindset? Not likely, because you won't want to get out of bed. So I've been doing a lot of the talking. This is your podcast. What else do you want to know? Or what else do you want to ask me or share with the audience yourself? Yeah, so I've been listening a lot. And, you know, the, I, going back to my own journey, I think it was 2018 or something that I started having an interest in, in TMS. And mm. I was the whole time, because it was only about pain. I was like, oh, this will never apply to me. Hmm. But every page I, I, I continue with, those could be. And, and then what is the difference between pain and fatigue? Not, not a lot, actually, right? Yeah. So then there came a moment, and that was after those three days that I thought, it's TMS, together with some exhaustion from sleep deficiency and, and stress. And but sleep that, matters, sure. Yeah. But I remember that there, there, there came a few days of, or a few weeks even of being really sleepy and, and sleeping like 12 hours a day and, and being a little bit groggy. But after that, that went away and I was energetic and I could go on hikes. But sometimes the hike was a bit scary. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then um, I did like I committed to a five hour hike. And then the next morning I woke up feeling like shit. That was again my. That's the thing. You said the key word. The hike was a little scary. Perceived. Yes. Now yeah. let's talk about that because for anybody who seems like you can do an event, but you pay for it later. My perception of what's going on there. Let's say you go on a five hour hike, and you're feeling okay on the hike. You're doing all right. If there's a delayed reaction with symptoms hitting you later. Sometimes it's a hypervigilant brain always looking out for danger. And after a five-hour hike, we do have normal muscle soreness and muscle fatigue, meaning our muscles are tired, right? It's just Which can, can, can also be scary if you're not used to using your muscles. Well, that's the thing, though. The next day when you feel that normal muscle fatigue, I mean, you wake up and you go, yeah, I took a hike yesterday. No wonder I'm, my legs are tired or sore or whatever. Um, the brain can over amplify those normal muscle fatigue, muscle soreness in a hypervigilant brain that's always looking out for danger and trying to keep you safe is going to go, oh, no, Daniel, what did you do? You did too much yesterday. Go lay down. We're fatigued and the brain can instantly turn the fatigue on based on the perception that you should have never gone on that hike. It was scary. You did too much. You're on your feet too much. We're sore. We're tired. We're exhausted. We're fatigued. Boom. And that's how we can get floored for a week because the perceived danger combined with a little muscle soreness from using your muscles in a way that you haven't for a while can just turn the alarm system on loud. The brain goes, oh no, we got a problem. Boom. Fatigue is back. And then of course the thinking says, I knew I was doing too much. I shouldn't have done that. I got to go slower next time. Next time I'm going to go on a 20 minute hike, right? And now all of a sudden we've listed hikes as a trigger that says never again, can't do that again. And our world shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until we don't leave the house. Yes. That's my understanding. So sorry to keep jumping in there with these, you know, no, good. stories. And I think um, I've been talking a lot on YouTube and, and, and my podcast. So people are probably maybe a little bored already and they are wanting to listen to you. But you also have got a YouTube channel with, I think, every day a new video, right? For several years in a row. Yeah, I think it's going on uh, 1,390 days in a row, which is April 1st will be uh, four years daily, every single day without missing a day. Uh, it's called Pain Free You. So if you search YouTube for Pain Free You, or if you just go to dansyoutube.com, it'll forward you right to it. Um, but yeah, I post the videos. There's a great community in the comments section. A bunch of people who are showing up all the time and commenting and helping each other and supporting each other. Um, so yeah, it's it's been very enjoyable. I have a Facebook community as well under the same name, Pain Free 
you. Great. And they can also book you as a coach? I'm not currently doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, primarily due to demand. Um, last fall, I was booked for three months. <laughs> if you wanted to talk to me, you couldn't get on my schedule for three months. I had that many people. I literally had like 100 calls booked. Um, and it became overwhelming to me because then I'd constantly have people going, but I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. And my schedule says three months. And they're going, I'm in a crisis. You mean I, I got to wait three months? That's just like trying to wait for a doctor three months till you can go see them. Oh, yeah. So a year and a half ago, I set up a group coaching program which allows me to help way more people. And honestly, it ends up being the same information because I built it into a video course, which summarizes a lot of the stuff I talk about into a two hour video course. Um, but then I started, excuse me, I started out with two days a week, group coaching. And just two weeks ago, I went from two days a week to four days a week. So Monday mornings, Tuesday afternoons, Wednesday afternoon and evening, I do group coaching calls. And between those four calls, I have well over 100 people show up to get help. And so um, I'm now able to help at least 100 people a week or more, as opposed to doing one-on-one -on -one calls where I might be able to do six or eight one-on-one -on -one calls. And I was tapped out because they're they're pretty uh, time consuming and uh, take a lot of energy out of me. Yeah, I yeah, I, com I completely agree. Sometimes I'm floored after that, trying yeah. to understand, trying to talk, listen, and, and well, you know. Yeah, so in any so event, yeah, I, I, I do have a group, my website, uh, if you don't mind me telling people. No, uh, no worries. The website is painfreeu.com. And if you go to the Get Help menu item, you'll see the link for the group coaching. I also have a good getting started page, which is a really good primer for anybody who's kind of new to this stuff and wants to understand this perceived danger pain, how it works. There's some assessments that kind of help you figure out that this is what's going on for you. The assessments are a little bit more geared towards pain or other symptoms. So you may have to kind of make it work by substituting the word pain for fatigue but you can get a really good idea as to whether or not it applies. And frankly, unless you truly have some medical emergency going on, I think the vast majority of fatigue is just exactly what Daniel and I have been talking about, which is the brain perceiving danger and go take a nap. It's too intense. Life's too intense. Yes. Great, Dan. Dan, thanks a lot for your time. Thanks for talking so much of your knowledge and sharing it with us. Well, thank you for introducing me to your audience. Uh, hopefully we can help some people out. And uh, I appreciate you inviting me onto the podcast. This was great. Great. Then thanks. And then I'll say bye to everyone. Bye. Right. <laughs> so long, everybody. Take care. Great.